Elite Squad. Welcome back to Sons and Shadows Cast, everybody. We're the only podcast that delves into the lost, forgotten, and canceled television series. Let's remember, relive, and revisit. We got to keep that memory alive, and we're back. We're back in a big way with a granddaddy of them all of canceled TV shows. That's right, Police Squad. My name is Detective Jeff something. And I'm Lieutenant Frank Kevin, Police Squad. And Al, well, I mean, Will is not really with us this go around. His head got chopped off somewhere in the process, but you will maybe hear from him again once we find his head for him. And we are back. Got 1982's ABC show, Police Squad. Join Detective Frank Drebin and Captain Ed Hawken as they solve the toughest cases of them all. They're full of all sight gags and puns, non sequiturs that made the series famous. This one is a trip, everybody. So buckle up. This is going to be a hell of a ride. It's created by David Zucker, Jerry Zucker, and Jim Abrams, who gave us other such classics as airplane movies and the Naked Gun series. All right, Kevin, what do you remember from this show? It's a little young for me, so I don't remember watching this when I was a kid. Well, when did you first get into this one? Oh, uh, probably when I was about four or five. Really? The, yeah, the first time I saw this, I was super young, maybe just a hair older. But my dad was a police officer going through the police academy at that point, and they just put a uh, uh, police squad out on VHS, and so we rented it. And I want to say he watched all six of them in one sitting. And oh wow! Yeah, I I didn't think I would ever sit through something like that, but. I was stuck, stuck to the TV. That's pretty good. Now, did this come out before Police Academy then? Was that 84 for that one? Or does this... Yeah, Police Police Academy was 1984. Okay. Police Squad, I think, was 1981 or 82. I think it was 81. I'm probably wrong. but I it's... think it was created in 81, but aired in 82. Because everything I was reading was saying this was like 1982 ABC fall show or spring show oh okay but yeah this this definitely predated the police academy and I, it felt like something police academy felt very much like the 80s police oh, yes. squad felt something more like the 60s and 70s going into the 80s yeah I, that's why i was curious like not that i mean to draw the comparisons between the two they're both like goofy spoof kind of movies that take different approaches to how they do it but as much as I liked Police Academy as a kid, as an adult, I think I was digging on this show because I'd never seen this before. I actually barely knew about this until you recommended we do this for the show. And I got to see it for the first time. And as I was watching it, the first episode, I was like, this is pretty interesting as I'm on my phone. And after 10 minutes, I'm thinking, okay, maybe I need to rewatch this because this is actually way more interesting than whatever I'm doing on my phone. And it got me to put my phone down and actually start doing notes and paying attention to things. So it grabbed me like right away. So it didn't take but like 10 minutes and I'm already, uh, I'm starting over and I'm going to start watching this straight through. Yeah, I mean, it's it's only somewhat normal for like two minutes, three minutes at best into the first episode. Yeah, it, that's it, why I was like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll be on my phone while I'm doing stuff, you know? Yeah, and it's your, your first hint that this is not exactly what it seems like as far as it being a cop show is finding out that Sally Decker, the, the woman that's the criminal in the first episode, owes money not to a bookie, but to her orthodontist. She's addicted to orth orthodontic work. And she, she keeps owing this guy money. And she's, she's wanting to take out loan after loan after loan at the bank that she works at. I thought that was completely hilarious. That was a really good storyline and how they unraveled the quote-unquote mystery and all the comedy and the, the dialogue that go, was going on. I love the whole spoof on who's on first, who's on second, or what's on second and whatnot as they were going through the interrogation with her. <laughs> that was absolutely hilarious. Yes, it was so great. And then, of course, the greatest question that goes through all six episodes is cigarette? Yes, yes, I know. That's what it is. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> or yes, it is. <laughs> I love the different variations on it. They didn't all. It may, may have seemed like they were all answering the same, but there was once or twice when somebody else did it a completely kind of way, like, yes, I know, or yes, it is. Yeah, like each actor that, that did it kind of brought something different that made it funny each individual time. 
Yeah. Like there wasn't a single time where they pulled a gag or a running joke and it wasn't not funny. Right. The inflection was very different from one to the next. There was very little in common other than the yes. <laughs> yeah, like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing I was digging on was like the narrated episode name versus the printed title card name for the episodes, which at first I didn't really pick up on until like, I want to say it was like the third episode where it's like the butler did it <laughs> the but <laughs> or a, a bird in the hand. I think it was yeah, the secondary those... title. And I'm like, wait a minute, what? Did I not catch this for two episodes? Yeah, like because, well, if you're looking down, you have no way of knowing. Because, I mean, that, that title flashes fairly quickly in front of you. Yeah. But, uh, no, the, the one specifically that you said, the butler did it, or the one in which the butler did it, whatever it was, uh, right. at the end, you're kind of like, oh, shit. They spoiled it at the very beginning. Right. <laughs> so you're like... You're sitting there watching this mystery, wondering who did it, and then you find out at the end, oh, well, they told you at the beginning, the butler did it. Yeah, because for every episode after that, I, I'd kind of be paying attention to that specifically and be like, is this a hint, or are they actually giving it away, like, every time? And quick look, I wrote some of them down. The Guilty Alibi, Terror in the Neighborhood, and Testimony of Evil for Dead Men Don't Laugh. I think I'll have to watch the show again to really... uh delve into that one yeah it's funny you should mention that i was re-watching again a little bit tonight and i um gosh what episode was it the fifth episode the the bombing the where oh, the uh, ju yeah. where the judge judge gets bombed and the old con gets pinned for it basically that one i had to rewatch a little bit and it's it's partially because we watched this series maybe two weeks ago yeah a week and a half ago and we did all the paperwork for it, but we didn't get a chance to record for it until tonight. Yeah. But it's it, it was a nice refresher. But aside from needing a refresher, Police Squad is one of those shows, it's kind of like MST, where you could watch it multiple times and always catch something new. Right. I mean, even the, even the jokes that you're that you're anticipating, those will always remain funny but you're always going to catch something else new that's either happening in the background or something that they said. And it's police squad is just, it's, it's very fluent that way. And I love, I love it for that. Yeah. It was always engaging with its comedy too. It never felt like it was being too stupid at times or even like way too slapstick at times. The only time it ever really got pretty close to being a bit much and I'm not even saying it was a bit much, is when they did the freeze frame stills at the end of every episode and something was always still going on around them. It's like, you're kind of breaking the fourth wall a little bit, but it was, it was like writing the fine line. It's like, I actually was appreciating that while everybody's trying to like, and I'm mimicking like a, a fake po Vogue pose. I was yeah. calling it Vogue, you know? Everybody was in the Vogue and Madonna reference everybody for anybody younger than the age of 10 who doesn't know what we're talking about, but everybody being in the pose and then like the, the creepy old everything. lady, the plastic lady in leather. Yep. <laughs> well, sorry. I just started horribly thinking about Madonna's plastic butt and it scared, it derailed me. <laughs> That's a cancel TV series <laughs> waiting to happen right there. <laughs> Madonna's plastic butt. <laughs> <laughs> if we get that hashtag and we got a whole different dynamic we can appeal to in our audience. Side note, but everybody that made fun of Cher in the 80s and 90s owes her a huge fucking apology. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with you, Trace. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Where, where were we with the police squad? I know we were just talking about that. We were Sorry. doing the talking about the freeze framing and oh, the freeze I thought that framing. was, it was pushing a little bit of the campy line, but I thought, it, I thought they nailed it like every time. I think so. And I think a lot of people felt that way too, because when, when we did social media, a lot of people kept referencing, they liked the freeze frames. And one of the things that I liked about it, and I, I want to say it was one or two episodes, maybe, where they're frozen, like you said, but everyone else is is moving actively. I, I don't remember if it was Nordberg or, or a criminal just getting completely freaked out because they couldn't tell why everyone was just, right, Frank and, and Edward just standing there normal, like not doing anything. That was what the second or third episode, I think. 
Yeah, they just like the paranoia of what was happening was just killing me. Like, I don't know. I love. Was that your like favorite that. one then? No, I I want to say my favorite one is probably the one that's behind me, where where they're pouring coffee yeah. and supposed to be doing the freeze frame, and the coffee's just overflowing onto the cup and pouring onto his hand and burning him. He can't do anything. <laughs> Well, I saw his eyes like dro droop down like once to be like, oh God, I can't move. <laughs> if they could have shown a tear, a single tear rolling down that face, it would have been hysterical. Oh, I know, right? How did you feel about this, about its timeliness with its age? I mean, we talked about it being aired in, in 82, but it felt more like a 60s or 70s cop show. Like, it, does it still hold up being funny being that cop show? I think so. You could actually probably get away with a show like this today. I mean, this is not a show you had to watch, like, the sensitivities that are in our society today, at least not a whole lot. There might have been a jo one joke here, one joke there, that maybe you, you cut that out, and you could run this show on network TV and not be a problem at all. So I still think it holds up. I mean, the stories, they're short. They're concise. They're to the point. When you first brought their show up, I'm like, okay, six episodes. They're probably 45 minutes a piece. Okay, I'm moving. I'll see if I have time. And then when you finally explained, no, these are like 25 minute episodes. I'm like, oh, well, absolutely. We can, I'll take a look at this. And if I could have, I would have burned through this in one night. And so the timeliness, you ask about whether the show fits today with its timeliness and or even at the time when it first aired, I think there was a there's a place for a show like this. And I thought there was a show on Fox that was a bit comedy. I don't know. Is that Brooklyn Nine-Nine or something like that? I don't really watch Fox. I think so. I think it had Andy Samberg in it. Yeah, I think that was a bit of a comedy. I never watched it. So please correct me if I'm wrong on that. But there's a place for short parody shows like this i mean with every all all the genres on tv now you got place procedurals you got the ncis's you got you got the reality shows you could do something like this now with probably an ncis you do a quick little 23 minute little comedy special and you spoof the ncis kind of like this you know you could do the dry humor you could be the more slapstick you know, it gives a form to, to new comedy to, to kind of stretch its wings. You don't have to go for the hour or two hour or three hour specials. I don't know, but like this show, I thought its time was perfect back then. ABC obviously didn't give a damn about it. And it, you watch it now on Blu-ray like I did. And damn, look looks freaking awesome on the Blu-ray. And it would fit anywhere on any network just in reruns right now. What do you think? I'm, I agree with you. I, I want to say in the early 90s when Comedy Central reran it, like it had a steady viewership of people watching it in the same Mannix or the Mod Squad and things like that. Oop, says my internet connection's unstable. So if I go out, I apologize. No ghosts this time, just new digs. Yep. I want to say that it fit. I want to say it, it felt very authentic for its time. And the fact that they were able to come up with mysteries within 20 minutes and then pack those 22 minutes chock full of so much jokes that you couldn't count them all. This might have been the smartest thing on TV in that time. And it's like you said, ABC felt that because one person didn't get into ABC, that they felt that the general audience was too stupid to get it. And TV is always, or studios have always kind of viewed their audience in that regard. Basically mice to be fed and, and yeah. a, a dog to be wagged. And that really hasn't changed. We just look at it differently. But as far as it, could it go on now? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, it's smart enough. I, mm -hmm. I think it would be popular. But even then, the Zuckers were saying, you know, that they're kind of glad that they got canceled when they did because they were running out of ideas. Oh, After just yeah. six episodes, they were running out of ideas. And it's like, well, I mean, if you guys are doing really well. If you guys find like-minded writers, I think that could keep generating gags as well as mysteries. 
And, you know, there's no shortage of gumshoe stories to borrow from as far as like plots and bad guys and things oh, like no. that. You got like the pulp novels. You got all the film noir movies from like the 30s through the 50s. You could have pulled from a little bit. Yeah. And Frank was very much that gumshoe character. Yeah. You know, it was, anytime he was having his monologue, you'd hear the saxophone playing in the background. That was great. Yeah. And, and Leslie Nielsen's monologues, if... For those listening at home, if you haven't caught the Naked Gun or Police Squad before, Leslie Nielsen was a was a straight faced actor until Airplane. Yeah, and when he did Police Squad, he performed the role of of Frank Drebin as a very straight, hard nosed cop, and it was the world around him that was completely insane and crazy. And that's one of the things that made Frank so believable. And I want to say made Leslie Nielsen such a standout character because he was he was the straight man and the rest of the environment was the funny joke maker it just it worked out really well but today with as fickle as, as studios are i don't know if if they would if they would let that last uh something like sirens that was on usa that would be a, a comparison somewhat okay. where you had straight emts and all this, all this stuff that they went to was completely crazy. Like the guy with three bars shooting out of his chest going, oh man, that guy over there, I bet he's got problems. <laughs> you know, when you're like, uh, okay. Or Miz, Miz was in an episode and he's supposed to be one of those uh, jockish show-offs in, okay. in the gym. And he gets stuck in the leg press because he pulls a fucking muscle. Oh, <laughs> but he doesn't... <laughs> He doesn't want to let go because he doesn't want let doesn't want anyone to see that he fucked up. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so I mean shows like that, but then even Sirens, I want to say Sirens got canceled after two seasons because USA didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, you could probably almost look at this like it was a little ahead of its time in that it could have been just a limited series. It could have been the short episode runs. Like you do six episodes, you let the, everybody go on to like other projects and then four or five six months later you do another six that way you get a chance to breathe everybody gets a little time away from the characters and hey i still like doing this and you could maybe get another you know six episodes here six episodes there sooner or later you got you know a good 20 couple dozen episodes and then you could just send them into syndication you know at that time like they thought oh the big episode order needs to be at least like 50 to 100 episodes to get syndication rights but honestly if you had probably about 20 to 24 episodes you could probably net some some bank on that somewhere on some affiliate tv stations at least my opinion oh yeah especially syndicating i mean i know syndication you need you need that 100 episodes but the way that they could air reruns and stuff like that over over 52 weeks every other week you just you know you got your new episode Right, and you also got a show that's fairly episodic. Nothing really ties in one another except for the one episode where they talk about, like, the four people that were already arrested that hadn't happened yet. But if you only watched that out of order, you would catch that and be like, what the hell are they talking about? But, like, largely it's episodic. You could air these episodes in whatever order you want. And that's, that's syndication's dream right there, is you don't have to put something in an order you could just throw an episode up yeah and this something like this i i would like to see this unfortunately of course leslie nielsen's long past but almost everything that he did that the suckers were involved in was gold yes there was never anything that was that was crap and god forgive me even scary movie three had its moments with leslie nielsen like he He was was funny in that yeah he was in three and four he plays the president. Oh, I only watched like the first two. <laughs> Those are the only good two. Yeah. But he and, God, I want to say it was Ja Rule. Uh, oh, wait, were in was the he doing one. like the Exorcist spoof in the scary movies? No, he was the president. Uh, okay, no Repossessed mind. was the Exorcist spoof. Oh. He was supposed to basically be George W. Bush. Oh, uh, okay. And when the aliens arrive, he's reading the kids. Oh, okay. <laughs> just like when the, the planes hit the twin towers bush was reading the kids but ja roll comes up to him as he's, they're reading the story about this duck sir we've, we've got a problem one moment sir there's aliens are 
yes, but I, I'd like to find, we're about to find out what's happening with this duck. And, and he's just like, he has this really like sincerely intent look on his face, like telling Ja Rule to stuff it basically, because the duck is more important. And he, you know, you watch that and you're like, wow, that is the president. No shit. So, I mean, he was great in that, but yeah. Well, he, Jeff Anderson, not Jeff Anderson, Anthony Anderson and Kevin Hart. They were the three reasons to watch that movie. Okay. But as far as being able to do the different stories that they wanted to do, I want to say it was Jeff Zucker that, that said, ultimately it worked out for the best in the end because they had so, so many ideas for jokes and so many ideas for stories that they were able to go in the reverse order of, of trimmers, start out with their short TV series that got canceled, and then make three very successful movies. Which they did so, a fantastic job on. Yes. Uh, some of the jokes were repeated. Right. All the characters were the same, but they were interchanged uh, actors. And when we get to the Naked Gun series, we'll talk more about that. But like Frank's boss is different. Norberg is a different actor altogether. Right. Uh, Johnny, I think, is gone. And I don't even as... remember him in the movies at all. No, I, uh, Al was in the movie still. Right. And and the, uh, I want to say scientist, the Q-type character. I can't think of his name. Oh, crap, I don't remember. The one who's always teaching kids something horrible about science and life. <laughs> I think I wrote his name down somewhere, but I thought that was kind of creepy at times. Like, oh my God. And make sure you bring, you know, like mommy's underwear here for something or other. Yeah, or next week I'll show you why women can't play professional football. Bye. It's you're like, what the fuck? So I was like, what are we walking in? It always felt like we were in the middle of something going on there. And only a couple of times was it like, that's a little creepy. Other times it was just like, wait, did somebody just finish a joke and we never caught the first half? I mean. <laughs> yeah, like you're, that's, and that's part of the fun. It's like, you're left wondering what the rest of the joke was because you're walking in and he's, and he's giving a lesson about fish breathing underwater by drowning a cat <laughs> you're trying right. to put a cat underwater <laughs> and uh, that's why land animals can't breathe underwater <laughs> <laughs> would you like to keep him Susie? oh boy would i <laughs> oh my god dude this show is off the hook i had a fun time watching this one yeah i'm glad you said yes to it and i'm glad that, oh, that yeah. you enjoyed it because this shit has been making me laugh since i was a little kids like my dad thought that he was like lieutenant frank drebin my dad's not that cool remotely at all like he was a typical cop nobody likes cops frank drebin's just awesome well actually no frank's pretty much the quintessential cop anyway my dad wasn't as cool as frank but but going back to the original thing my old man would rent that and that was kind of his inspiration to be a cop at the time he was going through the academy and he kind of looked up to, to Leslie Nielsen as far as being that cool detective, yeah. which my dad eventually did become like in 10 years later from then. So right on. Eh, it wasn't the greatest thing having a cop for a dad as a kid. I will say this about that. You learn how to do things properly, legally, and how to do things and to get around all that shit. <laughs> you learn how to not break the law or not get caught especially when you get home and taking your dad instead of uh, juvie or anything like that. Yeah, that's true. When I used to do my ghost hunting and shit like that, getting caught in the cemetery after hours would have been bad. There is, where I grew up, there was a lot of gangs and, and uh, graffiti that would happen. So the, the cops would basically be bored in San Juan Batista. Oh, okay. And they always knew people would be up at the cemetery doing stupid shit. Screw so, yeah. Yeah, so if they were bored, they'd head up there to see if people were drinking, knocking over headstones or stuff like that. No, we were just taking pictures of the dumb shit, wasting time, having fun, scaring the shit out of ourselves. Right. Oh, his name was Mr. Olson, the, the scientist. A forensic guy. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, that's the word. No, he was, he was pretty great, but my biggest lament that didn't make it from police squad to the naked gun was Johnny the Snitch. Oh my God, right. Like that was the greatest character next to Frank on the entire show for me. He was so smart about like everything, but you had to pay him. Yes, I, it's, it's that running gag where, you know, I don't know nothing about that. Well, you know, here's the 20. Well, don't tell no one I said nothing, but 
you know, and, and he would always give Frank the information, you know, after maybe like 20 to 60 bucks, he'd fucking answer all of Frank's questions. And then towards the, what was it? The, the third, fourth episode, I think it was the fourth, fifth and sixth episodes. You started getting guests on that would come sit down after Frank celebrity guests. It went to Dr. Joyce brothers, yeah, <laughs> which I just watched. That was great. Uh, oh God, who was it after that? Tommy Lasorda. Yes. Which I almost didn't recognize him. <laughs> oh really? Oh yeah. shit! I I saw that and went fuck. I want to slim fast. <laughs> it's Tommy Lasorda. I saw him and I'm like, is that who I think it is? And then I heard the name Tommy. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> it made me laugh. I mean, he looked really young. But uh, and then Dick Clark. They had Dick Clark on there asking about ska. In 1982, he was asking about ska. And Johnny basically tells him it's it's, uh, rock and roll meets reggae. And that none of the, to forget about it, because none of the kids today are ready for it. It won't make a scene for another 10 to 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, and so the last thing that, that Dick Clark asks Johnny is, hey, Johnny, I need more of that eternal youth cream. And so he hands Johnny another 20. Johnny pulls this jar of face cream out of his fucking pocket, and Dick Clark starts to, like, violently and vigorously rub it into his face. <laughs> yeah, that's when I kind of figured out what was really going on. And I'm like, do you have any more of that young cream? <laughs> I'm like, uh, what? And then he started rubbing it. And I'm like, oh, I got now I get the gag. Yeah, I mean, that was that was one of the first times I'd ever seen the fourth wall get broken. I mean, it, I want to say Mel Brooks was the first time I ever saw someone yeah. break the fourth wall. But the Zuckers, for that being a different type of humor, were very good at it, too. Different, oh, but, so. but great. Mel Brooks is, of course, when he would break the fourth wall, that's where he would just like wink at the camera or, you know, come yeah. on, walk walk this way and then wink at the camera this is completely different where it's it's more meta where you know yeah they just predicted frank or dick clark having the uh face cream needing the tears of children or whatever to keep himself young. <laughs> that was pretty that was pretty fun. i loved all of those which took another 30 years no wonder yeah. why you always look so goddamn young <laughs> yeah. and then the the celebrity deaths at the beginning Oh my Each god. Each celebrity right. death had its had its own bright moment in it. Special guest. I, I want to say most people, when we asked what was your favorite, yeah, is we asked people who who was your favorite guest star, what was your favorite celebrity death? And for whatever reason, because there was six deaths, uh, Twitter wouldn't let us run a poll. You can only run like four questions on a poll. I'm like, well, that's stupid. But I want to say the majority of the people. Yeah, the Twitter's very goofy like that. Not very user friendly, Twitter. But I want to say, by and large, people all said William Shatner. And I don't know if that's because Shatner was like the most recognizable at the time or still the most recognizable. But like, I wouldn't say he was my favorite. I would say I was probably the happiest to see him get get killed just because he's an ableist right. and a misogynist and everything else but robert goulet his death killed me where they had him at the firing squad and they ask him if he wants a fucking blindfold and he like snubbly says no and he puts his chin up super high in pride and gets shot yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then returns as the villain for one of the naked gun movies which is outstanding so, at least it shows that this the movies carried on the legacy of the show, at least for as best as it could. Yes, they made, and again, we'll, we'll talk about that much later in the next yeah. episode. They made a few mistakes, but for the most part, they kept it pretty solid. Um, the movies were, were a lot more Hollywood, a lot more film-like than the TV show was. The TV show is, is of the same vein. It was the foundation for what the movies would become. 
but it was very much that direct cop TV show. It didn't have the whole movie aspect to it. There was no love interest for Frank, no Priscilla, nothing like that. Um, there wasn't time for that. It wasn't necessary. Absolutely not. I mean, maybe if you had gone on for another bunch of episodes, you could have done something, but for a short episode like this, you didn't need it. You had the buddy, but he's with all the other cops in the precinct that you could bounce along and whatnot and the, the relationships they all had. Something that I really liked was how everybody got along pretty easily, like, and, and the really easygoing attitude between like Al and the captain and Al and like others. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty funny. And, and I love the, like the short, the short cop that they were talking to and you, you didn't realize that they were like of the short nature, the, one of the little people. Yeah. And then when they start walking away, it's like the camera pans down and it's like, oh, so we have everybody's included in this. <laughs> yeah, like they didn't cut anybody out for any reason in this show. I mean, yeah, the 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 joke at the little person's expense, that was, that's a tad ableist. You can't do that much right. anymore, but it was funny. Like, it was a good sight gag. He was looking down like he was hitting the intercom. But no, he was just talking to the next officer that was sitting there. Oh, yeah. No, that was that was good stuff. I don't know if you caught it, but I did catch one sci-fi thing in the whole shebang of this show. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, that's not Shatner? No, it's um the final episode when everybody is getting drugged um when he's getting drugged up and he's having a, he's driving along and he's getting all trippy. Oh, 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 there's oh, the oh. scene with Battlestar Galactica. So a Cylon ship from Battlestar Galactica from 1978, or whether they used it from the show, but it's really the movie. They had a, uh, a space fight scene, very brief. So if you blinked, you missed it. I just died laughing the second I saw that. That last episode was a doozy. That was great. As far as finales go, it was pretty perfect. Yes. The only thing that would have made it perfect is the original beginning. The original intro, the celebrity death was John Belushi. Oh, I didn't know that. And yes, and because he died before they aired the episode, oh. ABC decided to reshoot the episode with another, or I'm sorry, reshoot the intro with another actor. Yeah. But ha that having been done, it, when it hit the cutting room floor, it got swept up. So the footage of Belushi getting killed in police squad apparently no longer exists. Oh man, long and yeah. gone. That might have been a great, great intro. I mean, I'm sure it was. It was John Belushi. Nothing he did was was poor or mediocre. He was very underrated. Yeah, you know. So I mean, it that would have been really good to see. I would I would have dug that. But otherwise, it had Dick Miller in it. Oh yes, it did. It had. And, and you know how how much I love Dick Miller. Like anything he's in is worth watching. It, it had a great bit where Frank goes undercover as a comedian. Oh, I love that episode, dude. That was the greatest shit ever. And then, and then you see him talking about wanting to to sing one of the one of the songs that he's one of the best songs of his time. And he's going to invoke Judy. Yeah. And he's got he's got his 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 bow tie undone. And he's he's got his his microphone out like he's singing like Jerry Lewis or Dean Martin yeah. and starts going clang 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 goes the trolley ding 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 goes the ding. you're like oh my fucking god stop I have to say that was the episode that really like just put a smile on my face from ear to ear the second he started going undercover like that because he got to do. I don't I never saw if he did any sort of comedy act otherwise but he looked like he was nailing everything like pitch perfect oh. I mean and I just yes it, like dude was made for this role like if he could have gotten more infamous or famous from this that would have been great but at least Naked Gun brought that around for him and he was able to become the, the really respected star he he deserved to be yeah and he he will always be a legend i think of, of comedy yes. in in the same regard that we said mel brooks is he's that 
he's the symbol for the Zucker comedy, I think, or the Zucker genre. Um, he's the face that you think of because because even when people try to uh, what's what I'm looking for, basically imitate Zucker films, they try to save up as much money as they can to throw at Leslie Nielsen to make that seem more authentic, right? Like Repossessed or superhero movie or bunches of other shit. Yeah, he's had a pretty Super- good career. So, was superhero movie a Zucker film? I don't know. I don't know. I all I remember is that the bad guy was Shooter McGavin. I can't think of his real name. He asks the Peter Parker character, "Oh, how's your parents? They died five years ago, but otherwise they're fine." <laughs> 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 That was like the best part of that fucking movie. Or no, that the kid that wants to get uh, or has superpowers, his friend wants to be a sidekick, so he thinks he has superpowers too. So Leslie Nielsen shoots him in the leg just to make sure. <laughs> oh, I I have seen that. What the hell is that called? Uh, yeah. I want to say the guy was Ant Boy or some shit like that. He looked like Ambush Bug almost. Yeah. Oh, for all the the Gen Xers, we talk about Ambush Bug. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any favorite uh one-liners from this at all or anything like that oh yeah or don't yeah. don't read an entire script i mean that doesn't count <laughs> yeah the the entire script is smarter than shit but um i think my favorite's always going to be who are you and how did you get in here mm-hmm. i'm a locksmith and i'm a locksmith and you're just like well oh, okay cool bravo <laughs> <laughs> That and cigarette, yes, it is. Yep, the cigarette one I like the most. Otherwise, I wrote one down from episode four, the uh, the guilty alibi. Is this some kind of bust? And then Leslie's oh. like, "Yes, it is very impressive, but I, but we'd like to ask you a few questions." And I just, <laughs> I just was, I had to rewind it. I'm like, "Wait a minute, did I just hear this correct?" It made you really think about it because. It's kind of random, but it kind of fit like everything going on dialogue wise in this show. Yeah, and that was risque for eighty two. That's what I was thinking. You know, this, you're like, ooh, that's saucy. <laughs> so I'm trying to market this as some sort of like a police sitcom sort of thing, or just comedy spoof or whatever. Like, wow, as a kid, that's kind of I'm kind of pushing it a little bit. But you know, if He's you get like maybe you get like one free, like you can push the line one free one free pass every episode but i only caught like that one it was the most risque thing i heard the entire show i think <laughs> and it was so matter of fact like yes and it's very lovely but <laughs> <laughs> we're actually here to ask you a few questions god what i was gonna say what would have made that scene more perfect was, was when she says do you mind if i change and she walks behind the tatimi if she would have walked out and a, another actress would have walked out it would have just been the swellest shit i've ever seen like oh yeah that was great <laughs> Well, th- there's another scene like that where they were doing a disrobing. Oh, the um, the one gal was folding laundry, and she was getting packing up and and getting ready to move. And they're asking her questions, and she takes her coats and they get folded up. And I'm like, they're never going to get those coats back. And by the whole end of the whole sequence, they're walking out of the apartment in like their t-shirt, boxers, and like shoes. And the next time you see them, they're all wearing like brand new clothes with the tags still hanging from them. So they clearly knew that they <laughs> lost all of their clothes just interrogating somebody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of the funniest bits in this show were like the abused girlfriends or abused wives and and not just like physically abused, but like the uh, the boxer's girlfriend or the boxer's wife in the second episode yeah. where she's like an alcoholic. She's got a St. Bernard with a fucking barrel of whiskey under his fucking <laughs> neck following her. <laughs> yep. Oh, man, the comedy was great. And I, and I had to explain that to my wife, like, yeah, you know, in, in colder areas, they would have rescue St. Bernards yeah. that would fucking pull people out of the snow. And to warm them up, they'd have whiskey. Unfortunately, alcohol lowers your body temperature and you're fucked. Yep. Another great bit that they would do I don't know if they did it every episode, but most of them was the elevator bit. Oh, that was great, man. Those were fun. Having a conversation going down through the elevator 
open one door or open one floor halfway in between point A and B. And it's like either the Alamo going on with, with yeah. uh, uh, Cowboys and Indians or wars. You see a flying arrow flaming through the fucking uh, get stuck in the yeah. uh, inside of the elevator. And you're just like, that was just random funny shit. And it would be going on while they were giving away clues for who the killer was. Oh, yeah. And so you could totally miss what was happening depending upon what you were watching. Yeah, it was that gives you another credit to their show on how smart it was. Like they were hoping if you were paying attention close enough, you would pick up on things. But if you're like completely like, Hey, like one of those old viewers, like you're clicking through the pictures, um, you'd actually like kind of be more attracted to what's actually happening on screen than what's being said. So it gave you a little bit of a, I don't know. I give, I give credit for that being a little rewatchable in that way and that if you don't catch something you can go back through and you actually catch it by then oh i didn't catch that before oh there's something going on in the background oh they actually said something very important so i thought that was very clever that they were doing things like that yeah and see i think this show if it would run today it would have a a, a longer life on dvd oh, yeah. i think it would be something that just because people didn't catch it the first time around it's something that would people would want to buy so they could catch that extra shit. I think maybe that's something that ABC just didn't feel like people weren't catching the jokes right. or, or couldn't catch the jokes. And maybe they couldn't because home video wasn't a thing at that point. Right. Everything was about t um, appointment TV viewing at that time. I'm not positive about the Nielsen numbers. I think those were a thing around that point. And if you weren't, getting logged in somebody's little paper book then your numbers weren't very high and you couldn't really track anything else otherwise and that's what advertisers are always looking for today things are a little bit different they still rely on the ratings box but they still rely on like other numbers too because there's more available technologies better but like back then like yeah maybe the ratings just weren't what they were hoping for or needing to be but if they could if they wanted to when the naked gun movies came out if they wanted to get some more eyeballs on hey this is where we came from but whoever owned the home video rights at that time for like the vhs's they could have like maybe labeled it as the the beginning of the naked gun on the box or the naked gun police squad files you know you kind of you could have like really tweaked the name most people don't like that. I don't like it when they re rename or do that to shows, but if you wanted to get more eyeballs on it and that was your idea on home video at the time, at that time, not many people would have complained. They probably would have been pretty happy with that. And that could have gotten more eyeballs back on this for the home video. But I don't know if this came out on DVD, but I love that Blu-ray set, so. Yes, it is on DVD and that's what I have, unfortunately, because uh yeah this is paramount God, i want to say i found it used for like four bucks and i was like yeah 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 i got mine from amazon the just a normal well if the earth would stop hiding my uh yeah my special effects in the background here but yeah we're we're doing a little video for you podcast people we're, we're testing some stuff out this go around but i i love the blu-ray set this was great it's only one disc it's all six episodes the picture quality is outstanding the audio is pretty good i don't have my theater set up since i just moved here so i can't tell you about surround sound but um this is a pretty sweet set and this was very affordable i was very pleased i think i only paid like 13 dollars for this i believe oh wow so i was pretty happy that's not bad at all no and you, and you said the, the picture quality is really good? I thought so. Well, for an older show, of course, it's not going to be 4K and you can see people's spores and the nasal hair coming out at a curly angle. You don't see that. Yeah. This is for what this is for a show this old. I thought this looked pretty damn good. If, if they were to go back and restore it, I think it could look even better. But I thought this looked pretty damn good. And this had some standard um, special features on here, like an interview with Leslie Nielsen, which I watched. That kind of footage is very rough. 
that looks like it was recorded off of somebody's VHS. It, <laughs> as far as like, the picture quality of the actual show by comparison, it's night and day between the interview and the actual show. Show looks very good. The interview segments that are a little more archival interviews, those are a bit on the rough side. So just be aware of that if you go for the Blu-ray. But hey, if you want this and you're all about Blu-ray and physical media and whatever, I would recommend it. Yeah, I, I do want to upgrade to the Blu-ray because the DVD is still a little grainy. Okay. And it's it's not horrible, no. but it's not what it what it could be. Oh, I think you would totally. I think you'd totally like that. Yeah, so I, I definitely want to check that out. Because again, to me, this is the granddaddy of, of canceled TV shows. Uh, someone asked me if we were doing Star Trek tonight because I said we were doing the granddaddy of TV shows. I'm like, no, dude, we're doing something that's had an even bigger injustice than cutting a five-year mission down to a three-year mission. Yeah, Star Trek's a different animal with its cancellation anyway because that actually got greenlit twice and then their budget got cut. Then they got canceled, so... It may have been the biggest show that ever got canceled like that, but it's not the granddaddy. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's it spawned its own culture, of course, but uh, Police Squad spawned not only three actually successful movies, and I don't know if there's unsuccessful Star Trek movies, but there are shitty. The Star later Trek ones, movies. yeah. I mean, basically... Was was five the one with Spock's brother or, or David Bowie's wife? That was uh, part four. No, that was five. Yeah, that was the Final Frontier that William Shatner directed. Yeah, at least it ended with fucking Yosemite and singing "Row, Row, Row Your Boat." But um, yeah, I mean, I, I that one was okay. Yeah. After watching fucking the Voyage Home, it wasn't all that in a bag of chips. But what is? Yeah, I I had a, just to cap off Star Trek super quick is. Yeah, Wrath of Khan's really good. Voyage Home is really good. Undiscovered Country, I think that's a really good one, but that's probably the last of the original crew. And then you got to be talking First Contact. Generation sucked. After that, First Contact, the rest of the next generation movies are not good. If you're a fan of those, hey, power to you. I'm not. I still watch them. I didn't mind Generations. Generations is okay. It was okay. I didn't like that they killed Kirk. At the time, that bothered me because I didn't know that William Shatner is William Shatner. But I guess it still bothers me that they killed Captain Kirk as opposed to Shatner. But Malcolm Malcolm, no, Malcolm, Malcolm McDowell, McDowell. Yeah, Malcolm McDowell yeah. is a phenomenal bad guy in whatever he's in. His fucking monologues were marvelous. Yeah, those were good, yeah. Uh, and Whoopi. Yeah, Whoopi actually had a part in the movie that seemed more appropriate to her character from the TV show. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I get more of a problem with like insurrection to nemesis after that. So they're both equally shitty in different ways. Yeah, I don't like either. And Brian Singer was involved with uh, nemesis, so I'm not the biggest fan of him. But anyway, <laughs> and then they gave him an X Men movie twice, three times. And he still couldn't do it right. No. <laughs> you want to talk about directors on this, I did see a fun name attached to directing a couple episodes. Joe Dante. Yes. that's. Ex I'm figuring that's exactly how we got Dick Miller, too. Yeah, that's what I think, too. So, I mean, because it's like, oh, gosh, this is right before Gremlins. No. Uh, long time before Captain America. But it's like, I, I even told my wife, I'm like, you might want to sit and watch this. I'm like, Joe Dante directed. She's like, I don't care who that is. I'm like, oh. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but he's awesome. Hey, but that's a credit to like Joe Dante was involved. I don't think a lot of people would would really catch that he did some TV shows before he made it big as a movie director. Yeah, I mean, and I don't know if people, younger people today understand it, but that's like the, would be like if Tiko Watiti did fucking TV before going on to do Thor or, or Jojo Rabbit. Oh, right. No kidding. I mean, the only other name I kind of caught that I didn't really catch till a final episode was one of the writers, Robert Wool, otherwise known as Arliss from HBO's TV show Arliss, who was also in Batman 89 as the male reporter opposite Vicky uh, Alex North. Ollie North. Ollie. No. Wait. 
Alex North. Ollie North was the fucking <laughs> shitty general okay. or, or colonel. I'm like, I, cu- I couldn't remember the name. So I'm like, he was Batman 89, you know. Yeah. Ollie Knox. Knox. That was his name. Knox. Oh, shit. Bad fan. Knox. Yeah. Okay. That is actually correct. I remember that part now. And he was actually in, um, he played, he re- finally reprised that role in uh, Arrowverse Crisis. Oh, series. did you see that? No, I, I gave up on Arrowverse after a while. If you could find just the the uh, crossover, just the um, um, the Crisis on Infinite Earths, oh okay, that's actually not that bad. Oh, okay. And they they show like um, the characters from Birds of Prey. Uh, Burt Ward is on there, oh. uh, and then yeah, Ollie Knox sees the bat signal and goes, "Go get him, big guy!" And you're like, "Yeah." So you know they they make reference to to michael keaton batman which is nice oh. the shit part of that is uh, where the scene where flash is supposed to be running on the machine yeah. so fast to break the anti-monitors device he meets another flash from another multiverse and i'm like come on michael rosenbaum come on michael rosenbaum because most people don't know michael rosenbaum uh, lex from smallville played the voice of wally west on the uh, justice league cartoon okay yeah yeah but no they gave us ezra miller instead and you're just like Ah, uh, this whole shit's been so cool up until this point. And we see how well Ezra Miller's turning out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, he's thinking to himself, oh, we're gonna make this TV show better by putting me in it. It's like, <laughs> bitch, you're standing next to Grant Gustin. You suck balls. <laughs> Just wait a couple more years, dude. You're gonna hit rock bottom at that point, and nobody's gonna want to go back to this anyway. Yeah, I can't wait until he starts behaving like a child star and like burnout and wait he's an adult oh wait <laughs> <laughs> that already happened <laughs> flame out oh gosh naked gun we're back to naked gun but yeah so going all the way back from star trek i told my buddy yeah like this is the granddaddy of of canceled tv shows and the reason why i say that is because this movie or this series started a whole new genre like slapstick really hadn't been done much before not to this had, level, anyway. No, you had Get Smart, and that was about it, I think. Yeah. Which, Get Smart was fucking amazing. That ran only for, like, four or five seasons, too. Did it? Yeah, that didn't. At least I don't. Okay, let me look it up, or I'll... So I can correct myself. I mean, Get Smart was, was a little bit more James Bondish, but this this brought that that feel to the gritty noir detective stories. And so, it, spawning that huge basically new genre of comedy this is something that that probably could have taken off if it was given a chance if it was promoted like we've seen abc do shit like this before where they make six episodes of something and in this particular case six if you want to talk about clerks the animated series eight to eleven episodes and then they cancel it before it even hits the air because one person didn't fucking like it or get it so it's like this this TV show has has huge credibility because it got taken out by the knees. Oh, yeah. Like, before it, the horse even got out, the studio cut it by the fucking knees. So, for it being as big as it was and as big as those movies became, I give this a lot more credit as far as it being a genre TV show. Like, this is my granddaddy. Yeah, you can't even say that this failed to meet its target because of the... Star Trek... That spawned a whole lot of other shit, but it wasn't yeah, you always. You can't great. even say that this failed to meet its target audience because the movies obviously hit an audience because they turned out to be this massive success. And you think it came out of nowhere? No, it actually came from this show right here. This is the reverse of what we usually cover on the show, where usually the movies lead to the TV shows. This is one where the TV show led to the movies. Yeah, in that regard say like in the example of lethal weapon lethal weapon wasn't a bad tv show but nothing is the same as the lethal weapon movies like there's it's never going to be just as good right but again no disrespect to to that show because i really liked it but this police squad is just as good as the naked gun in some ways it's better in some ways it's inferior because again it's 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 20 minutes long it's a tv show so they can't do so much but they packed in so much more that was necessary and it didn't feel rushed the movies they added in well priscilla 
they added in Priscilla yeah. and that was an unnecessary character for Frank. So they, they made it a little bit different, giving him more of a character story as opposed to a crime story. But they were both equally good. You can't say that the series is better than the movies or if the movies are better than the series because they're just, they're just as good. They're just different. I couldn't agree more on that, but they're, they're both uh, a one-two punch together and I would totally line them up every time, especially going forward. Never seen the show before, so I am super happy when I go to do the movies for our next episode, so stay tuned for that one that I will actually be re-watching the show and then going straight into the movie so I can actually get a little more smooth transition all the way through and I can finally make a proper assessment of the legacy of the whole franchise as a whole. You know, I, I think I'm probably going to do the same thing. It's uh, only six episodes. Like, honestly, people, it's yeah. six episodes. It's a comedy. It's fucking hilarious. Yeah, I mean, I, I can get this done while my kids are at school. Yeah in less time that my kids get out of school. So, I mean, it's, that's no problem. And then watching the three movies, again, if you don't have a lot of time, you could watch them one at a time. Yes. Or if you do have a lot of time, it is no problem to sit and watch those movies in a binge session. Yeah, if you got just like even one hour, you can easily get through two, if not three of these. And one of the things that I will positively say about the Naked Gun movies, because I know people get down on on Slapstick, or, or, or movies sequels, comedy sequels specifically. Yes. Austin Powers, for example, you will get repeats of the same joke for the next two, three sequels. Yeah. They, they don't do that with The Naked Gun. No joke is revisited. Yeah, for Austin Powers, that's the law of diminishing returns, is what I would call that. You can't hit up the same damn thing every single time because people are going to get bored of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the... The beginning of part two, where they're trying to make all the sexual innu innuendos by jumping between one sentence to the next, that was funny for that. Yeah. But but then when they did it again in the third movie, you know, even though you've got uh, uh, Clint Howard, you're just kind of like, okay, they're just repeating the same joke yeah. with the same two actors. So Naked Gun doesn't have any of that. No. I mean, each movie stands strong on on its own feet. And the bad guys are all solid, too. Yes, I completely agree on that. And, and I, I, I want to say you see Anna Nicole's big-ass dick, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's no shortage of fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. But, you know, we had a whole bunch of questions from people when we said that we were going to be covering The Naked Gun. We had people asking uh, primarily where they could watch it along with us so they could like be fresh with it in their mind yeah. when they listen to the show. And we had unfortunately had to tell people this isn't streaming anywhere. And that's a goddamn shame. Like, it should be uh, on Paramount plus or whatever their app is called the Peacock. I don't, I don't know which one. It is. No, they, yeah. They got, they got Peacock. Yeah. Uh, that's NBC Paramount plus, yeah, okay. which is Viacom. And then uh, Disney, which is everything else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything else and in between. Pretty much. But yeah, I was, I was greatly surprised. And I felt really bad that we had to tell people, oh, God, you know, we're watching a classic, but you can't watch it along with us. Um, it is fairly inexpensive on both DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, yeah. I mean, you're paying a, a, just a tiny more than, than, what, two bucks per episode? Yeah. And that's that's really not that much for how much you're going to laugh each episode. So we, I, I personally recommend getting this for your physical media collection. If you've never seen it before, you owe it to yourself. Like, this is just silly-ass fun. And it's not cheesy. It's just silly. And my recommendation is, if you get it and you're not a fan of it, you probably know somebody who would be a fan of it. You know, you could probably give it to your mom, your dad, aunt, uncle, grandpa, they might get the biggest kick out of it. I'm not saying re-gift it. You, you can do that if you want, but give it to somebody who might like it. They probably will. Yeah, like there's, there's no shortage of slapstick fans. Like some people just have a, a, a direct express route to their funny bone. Yep. And this is probably it. Kevin, did we want to get into some social media before we say goodbye to everybody? <laughs> We've got probably more social media for this episode than we've 
ever gotten before. And yeah, this was massive, dude. I want to say like, you know what? People are finally listening to us. We've got all these people listening. No, probably heard no, this no. <laughs> I think it was just because people said, please squad. I fucking love that show. So, all right. Um, Nailed it. <laughs> first, we have Amanda Nichols, who said, I love Police Squad. Discovered it on a short run on Comedy Central a long time ago, and I found the humor and what was making it fun of primetime cop melodrama TV to be so spot on. It really was. Like like we said, it feels just like Mannix, as Frank would say, or, or the Mod Squad, which is one of the things that it was really trying to take from. So it did feel like that. Ann Brown said on Facebook, I discovered it when it first aired in 1982. Wow, 40 years ago now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us about that, Annie. And the best episode is Rendezvous. Rendezvous. <laughs> Rendezvous. <at the> Pacific <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't read that and not say it that way. Rendezvous. Rendezvous. <laughs> David Wright said, I remember when it aired on NBC, I think. The Zuckers were riding high on the success of Airplane. I loved Kentucky Fried Movie and Airplane, but I think this was their funniest work. I absolutely loved the closing credit gags the most. We still put on the holiday or put on the DVD during the holidays. Awesome. And I, you know, I'm kind of glad he said that because the Naked Gun DVD, or not the Naked Gun, uh, the Police Squad, and even Naked Gun, those are movies that you could probably turn on for like Thanksgiving yeah. when your family's over and all have a great fucking time, or even Christmas. They're not like the dirtiest fucking thing in the world to watch. Oh no, not at all. Paul Silva. He said, Bob's video had all the episodes. My friends and I freaked out when we saw Shatner as a guest star, not realizing that that was part of the joke. <laughs> um, I understand. Funny thing about Paul Silva, uh, I've talked about him before. Paul's little brother was my best friend in school. And he, Paul worked at Bob's video later on when we were in high school. Okay. And he's the one that that first introduced us to MST3K. So he doesn't even remember that. that like, he's like totally forged my path. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah. And Bob's video is where my dad used to rent this movie too. So that was kind of neat to get a response there. I really liked that. And then we hopped over to Twitter for a little bit. Robert Berry said, I remember catching the local ABC affiliate when I was in eighth grade. I think it was, I think it was a Thursday night show. The first episode hooked me. The scene at the or orthodontist's office with the increasingly elaborate braces just killed yeah. me. Yeah. Like what it is, is like they're going through all these poor kids with like headgear, braces, ginormous headgear, halo crowns. And you're like, God damn. I, I was impressed by how much they were able to actually do. Kind of like they, they took that scene from. Well, I'm sorry, no. Frank Oz took, probably took that scene for Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because Little Shop of Horrors came out in 84, 86. Something like that, yeah. That was, yeah. yeah. And we have Tim Bowen, who said, I watched it when it originally aired. It was so sad when it was canceled. I love how every episode mentions the villains from the past episodes when the new crook gets caught, or getting the new crook gets sent to prison. Uh, he says, I think I first saw it on YouTube, which was very interesting. Uh, the, then they bought the Blu-ray set. That's really neat because we usually hear people finding things on DVD. How awesome is it that they found it on YouTube? Like, it's just kind of a testament to the day and age that we live in. Like, oh, wow, I found this really awesome TV show on, on YouTube. Could, it could be said for the same thing about MST. Yeah. You know, like I, I found this 30, 40-year-old show just randomly on YouTube. Yeah, I've I, seen a couple of I shows on YouTube, actually, by, you know, I, I post up, like, old clips of, like, say, Brimstone from 1980, 1998, with John Glover and Peter Horton, but when I go to take a look at my video, just to kind of give it a once-over, well, once it's posted, I get recommended other things kind of in the same sort of uh, genre or some, whatever the algorithm does, I don't know, but it, I've stumbled across a couple fun old shows too it's like werewolf from like the 80s you got manimal which i never saw all the way and oh. i saw like the opening theme for that and i'm like i need to go back and 
I watched that with my dad. That's one of the first shows I remember watching with my dad. Not, he says we watched Dallas with my mom. I don't remember watching Dallas, but I remember Manimal for like a couple episodes. I remember Street Hawk. And, you know, I started seeing some of these from the YouTube algorithm. And now I'm getting all nostalgic to try and go get those back in my collection now too, despite how they may or may not hold up. Yeah, I mean, and if you look, there's even channels like a tv show will have an official channel mst has had an official channel for years yeah i just found out he-man has an official channel oh you didn't know that like, well, fuck no i mean i've got them all on dvd i have all the original the the four big box sets our friend rob i apologize i don't know who hired this dude for my co-host oh my god what <laughs> i'm kidding <laughs> we got a buddy rob you... on facebook who's a, a big he-man person so I know who Rob is. He made that goddamn documentary my son likes. Yeah, I was... But my son won't watch fucking He-Man with me, little bastard. <laughs> He'll watch Rob's fucking movie, but not the goddamn TV show. <laughs> Piece of shit. Anyway, we love you, Rob. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love you too, Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I talk so much shit about my kids on the show. But you love them. I, I don't know if we've released it yet, but the... The bonus episode we just recorded with a very special guest. I called my daughter the Antichrist, and you know, she thought that was funny anyway. So, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, but yeah, like, and what was the other one? Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters has had a channel for a long time, but just within the last four or five months, I think they're starting to put all the episodes of um, the real Ghostbusters cartoon on there. Okay, so you could watch you could watch those for free, and I think they rotate them out yeah that makes but, sense yeah it's like i don't want to pull out my box set every time the kids want to watch ghostbusters right. so i mean they just hop over to youtube for that so that's cool especially if you want the one episode that's on like the 13th disc and it, nothing's in order because somebody already went through it and moved discs around <laughs> yeah oh let's see who oh, next we've got gene o uh gino says i watched the show on vhs in high school in the late 80s not a perfect series, but way more hits than misses for people who think Airplane is hilarious. That's pretty fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he says, I'm a locksmith, and I'm a locksmith. <laughs> Might be the funniest reply I've ever heard on a TV show. <laughs> I'll give you that. That's pretty perfect. Yep. Because, like, he was almost fucking, like, making fun of the guy for asking something so stupid. Yeah, pretty <laughs> like, much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a locksmith and I'm a locksmith. <laughs> Dumbass. Uh, let's see, we've got RJ Nerd Dad says, I saw it when it first aired. I was eight. Uh, I watched it with my dad and we absolutely loved it. And he puts in the quotes, you've got something on your face, Al. No, the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Cut your hair, Al. Which the Al jokes, those were so great. And I wish they had more of those in the movies. I, I, I want to say the only one that transferred from the movie was that joke where he says, you've got something in your face and the fucking banana falls out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Drew Thulu says the whole scene where Sally Decker explains the bank robbery in the first episode was air deprivingly funny or air deprivingly hilarious, not funny, hilarious. Says I discovered the show after the naked gun and I'm eternally thankful that I did. See, and that's just another thing or another aspect of it. There's no wrong way to find this franchise. Exactly. Like you don't have to watch Police Squad in order to understand the naked gun or vice versa. Right. Let's see here. And then we have Steve Vistin, who said that he loved the list of tuba stores. Acme Tuba, Tuba World, Tubas R Us, Tuba or Not Tuba. <laughs> tuba. <laughs> that was tuba my favorite. Litigation. <laughs> tuba or not tuba tuba litigation <laughs> and then i think last is this the last one nope no there's a last. couple more here. samantha drennan i totally agree with what she said and i loved it says i remember how they would would make fun of cheesy cop show endings like how they did in the middle of something or standing in a group laughing and then go to freeze frame but it wasn't the camera that froze. It was only Frank and his boss. They would be looking, and everyone else was looking around awkwardly. Like we talked about at the beginning, that freeze frame where Norberg's trying to get in there on the pose. Like, yeah, I'm cool too. Like picking up the phone or whatever. <laughs> Those 
they're always great. And I, I love again where he's burning his hand with the coffee, smiling. <laughs> I think the only um, one we didn't mention was when the building was coming down around everybody. And I'm wondering, like, nobody got hit with that stuff. Oh, my God. <laughs> Fortunately. Or nothing major hit them. Because I'm sure they weren't doing styro. I don't know. They might have been doing styrofoam back then. But that stuff looks substantial. Yeah. Like, and even some of those big styrofoam rocks. I mean, like, yeah, it's styrofoam. But <laughs> the heavier ones are still pretty heavy, too. You're like, ah. Yeah. We used to throw those. I used to get those when I was a kid, collecting special effects type stuff and throw those at my brother. Oh, fun. Yeah. And let's see, uh, Bob Thayer says, I remember watching it on Nick at Night, and it was such a ridiculous but hilarious show. And that's cool. I didn't realize until Bob said that that it was ever on Nick at Night. Yeah, neither did I. I'm like, what? I don't remember. Like, last I saw, like, Nick at Night changed for me, like, the last two times I saw it. Like, Mm -hmm. In the 90s, you had the I Love Lucy type stuff right. and the Dick Van Dyke show. Yep. And then in the 2000s, suddenly they're playing fucking the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> like, yeah. that, that show's not that old, motherfucker. Not retro for the 90s quite yet. Mm-mm. No, we can watch Bewitch if you want to watch something in color. Oh, yeah. And now the last one is Brian O'Connell says, when I was a kid, I was already a big fan of Airplane and Airplane 2. So I got the show, and even though it was canceled because ABC thought their audiences were too stupid to get it. Well, they were too stupid to keep it. That's true. That's true. And I don't know if Disney owned ABC at that point or not, but again, they've done the same shit to just as good of shows like Clerks the Animated Series. Yep. That show was, was way too smart for people at the time. Well, and then you had the critic, but then that ended up going to another network, and then they did the same thing. It, they put it on right after the Super Bowl. Yeah, like they 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 put Clerks on right after the Super Bowl. Yeah. So like everyone's like, I'm not going to call football fans unintelligent, but everyone's drunk, rowdy, and then the other half of the people are just like pissed off because their team lost, and everyone's out. They don't want to watch the show. Yeah, with those low ratings, and then they played it out of context, uh, like the third episode first. They're just like, oh, nobody watched it. Sorry. Bye, Kevin Smith. Yeah, not everything's going to be like how they debuted the A-Team right after the Super Bowl, and that became a mega hit because of it. It's not the same kind of style of show, so that's not going to happen every single time. I thought A-Team was just cool because of the fucking intro song and and B.A. Baracus, man. That's Mr. T. I ain't getting on no pain, Hannibal. (laughs) <laughs> Better not talk about my mama. Hey, T loves his mama. We know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if we had an additional 45 minutes, we could play his Mother's Day uh, talk or his, his speech from the, for the it, WWE. Yeah. yeah, yeah, where he talked about his mom for 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah, then they made jokes the following year about like, uh, but I would talk about my mama, but I don't want to get into a fight with Mr. T about who's the greatest mama in the world. <laughs> uh, we love you, Mr. T. We're sorry. I do have one final question for you, Kevin, though. Um, sure. It's been a long time since this franchise has really been out there. Do you think it's time for a little resurgence remake? What do you think? For Police Squad or The Naked Gun? Take your pick. Uh, they would have to get somebody very fucking famous to be a hard-nosed person. Like, uh, I don't even know who they would pick. I got who an idea, but I don't think people would like my idea. I'm listening. George Clooney. Yes, that that would be the one. He He, yeah silver hair and everything he's got it i think he could do it i i hate to say it but i think he, he's not a bad actor I, he's just never been one of my favorites but i don't know i i think this role and i'm like who could really match leslie uh he probably could yeah yeah i i would say so i mean clooney's clooney is the the name that's well enough he does the the serious acting and even when he's he's comedic, like Oh Brother Where Art Thou, it's it's still very serious, and he he handles it really well. Yeah. And, and I think that's what whoever would play Frank Drebin would need to be. He needs to be that straight faced person. Yeah. So and you couldn't go get Gibbs because he's already pre famous. It would it would have to be somebody not known for that that cop role. Right. 
So I, I, I don't know. I'd want to say something like this could do pretty well. As far as what channel it would be on, that I really couldn't say. I wouldn't wish anything on Comedy Central. Uh, my guess would I wouldn't be, wish Comedy Central on anything. Yeah, my guess would be it, it'd probably hit one of the streamers. It'd probably be on like the Peacock, in my opinion, because they probably own the rights, but uh, for at least the television rights, because they're the ones who put out the home video. But if you're going to redo the movies, yeah, you could probably give that a little bit of a reboot. But I would, I would try and encourage to bring the original writers back on if possible so that they could get, you know, they could get a little more credit now going on these days. And they, they obviously know the universe and the world very well. Yeah. And also with that, I mean, mix in some new writers. Yep. So they're able to be shown exactly how it's done. Right. You know, it's, it's, you're not just creating a whole new show with whole new writers that don't get it. Right. Or that never got it. Yeah. It, Cause that's dangerous. Yeah, exactly. You could look at it like how they did ghostbusters after like, yes, I know there's a lot out there that didn't like it, but if you watch the making of, you see how Jason Reitman really worked and brought in the original behind the scenes people and asked everybody's opinions, what they thought of what he was doing. And he tried to incorporate old ideas, new ideas. He did the best he could and provided us with afterlife. And so when we get the sequel to that, it's actually going to be more all him already being kind of molded by his dad and the original creative staff behind the original Ghostbusters. So if they could do the same thing here, you could have you could capture some lightning in a bottle because there's clearly fans out there of this show and of this franchise. I think it's time to you could definitely take a look at this and hopefully it doesn't get too screwy on a streamer or a network. Yeah, it would go. It would work. There is a market for slapstick comedy still. We killed it pretty hard for the last 15 years or so. Yeah. What was it? Ever since Disaster Movie? Like after Scary Movie 4 came out, everybody was trying to make a Zucker film. They were cheap, they were stupid, and they were very borderline like the Asylum films for comedy. Like not another teen movie. Ooh. That one wasn't the worst. Oh, no, 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 no I'm sorry. Uh, not another date movie. Yeah, okay. Was, was not the worst. That, that one was funny. That one was okay. Eddie Griffin. Yeah. yeah. But like Meet the Spartans, that was fucking uh. horrible. Scary movie four or five and however many, those got really bad after a while. And those were Zucker flicks. And I like you, Wayne's uh, brothers, but man, at some point you hit you hit the curb. <laughs> oh golly, I don't know what happened to the Wayneses. Uh, they need to do a new and living color and start over again. <laughs> I would I would love that. The Wayneses, Keenan and his family are like the smartest fucking people. Like, Super just, talented. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, most people don't know it, but for as much as everyone loves Eddie Murphy Delirious, Eddie didn't write any of those jokes. That was all Keenan Ivory Wayne's. Yeah. So, I mean, the guy is just fucking hysterical. Yes. So, but closing out with, with uh, Police Squad, can it happen today? Sure, sure. But as long as it, it, it had a, a serious, genuinely good actor to play that straight cop, yep. it would not work. It, it would end up being Meet the Spartans and would just get lost at late night Comedy Central at best before getting canceled so yeah. it would be very iffy if they could do it again because we killed a lot of slapstick we'd ran it right into the ground yeah that's what we do we uh we squeeze blood out of turnips for, for <laughs> franchises and yeah. genres like and you wonder why people don't really pay attention to found footage movies anymore but what else can you say they do make comebacks eventually though everything goes in a cycle yes that's true that's true and the funny thing about this, speaking of which, for as much as fucking ABC thought the audiences were stupid, like, and they canceled a zany TV show. Can you think of a decade fucking zanier than the 1980s? Uh, like, nope. Not really. Nope. Like, you watch movies like Halloween 4 and 5 yep. and the teenagers in that, and you're like, yeah, they were that stupid. I remember that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah that, that, that was no joke. And people rail on that these days, like, oh, they don't have to be that stupid. You weren't around during that decade, were you? 
<laughs> Why? They're fucking dumber now. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> All we sorts of different issues. Us. Get your nose out of your phone. Unless you're listening to us. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, and that's after we go video. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in for Sons and Shadows Cast. This was Police Squad. Make sure you check us out on all of our social media platforms. We got Facebook, Twitter. We are at Sons and Shadows. We're also on Instagram at Sons and Shadows Cast. We are at sonsandshadows.com. Thank you again, everybody, and we'll see you down the road. Make sure you check us out on all of our social media platforms. We got Facebook, Twitter. We are at Sons and Shadows. We're also on Instagram at Sons and Shadows Cast. We are at sonsandshadows.com. Thank you again, everybody, and we'll see you down the road. It made me the host for a second. I was like, well, all right, I'll run this bitch by myself.